Hey guys, J. Stephen Roberts here, and I'm responding to a question from a Patreon supporter. Uh, this question is, what was life like for a medieval knight? And yeah, that's, that's a very intriguing topic, and it's, it's one of those very direct questions that I think can inspire a really interesting discussion. So I'm going to tackle it a bit. So who was a knight in the High Middle Ages? And we're talking about the High Middle Ages here. Uh, that's my period of history I most look at. So the 11th century into the 13th century. So the most important thing probably about a knight from this period of time is that he's a mounted warrior. This is the age of cavalry as kind of the most prestigious um, realm of the military. And so the status of a man who could afford an expensive war horse and the expensive equipment of a knight, well, this was what made you a knight, or one of the key things that made you a knight. In fact, this was a little bit fluid in the uh, 11th century at certain points. Um, you didn't necessarily have to be born with a very high status to maybe at a certain point be able to gain the wealth that you need to uh, have a war horse and have a knight's equipment, and then you would kind of be able to become a knight. Later, the social... Uh, classes kind of got a bit more um, solidified in terms of, uh, you know, the possibility of mobility. But uh, the German word for knight is very direct. It is Ritter. And what that um, means basically is rider. So it indicates very directly um, in a very concrete way, as German is, uh, what it is that uh, a knight makes a knight a knight. So knights were the ruling and the military class of their day. So they were the uh, professional warriors, and they were also the ruling elite. They were pretty much at the top of their uh, social status, along with the clergy. Uh, even a king was a knight. Um, all of these aristocrats were kind of part of this uh, larger thing called the order of chivalry, and a king would have been knighted at a certain point, uh, not even necessarily before he became a king. There were some kings who were knighted after they became a king, especially if they became king pretty young in life. But, you know, as a prince, he might be knighted. Um, the process of knighting uh, kind of conveyed in its very, um, in the very process of it, that uh, one man was sort of the uh, inferior or superior of the other. And in fact, there's an example of uh, one king knighting another king, and that is Alfonso VIII of Castile. He, he knighted his kinsman, uh, one of his relatives, Alfonso IX of Leon. And uh, later, Alfonso IX of Leon kind of resented Alfonso VIII for this because he felt that it was uh, putting him in a subordinate position. So in the feudal system of medieval Europe, if we're going to use that crude term, um, there was lordship and then there were vassals. So a knight could be either a lord or a vassal, or he could be both. And what this referred to primarily was a system of hierarchy. So um, a man could at once be a lord in his own right, like he might be lord of a certain territory, and he would have vassals under him. Uh, but he could also be the vassal to a man above him. And ex an example of this might be for uh, a king might have vassals who were some of the most important men in, uh, in the kingdom. Uh, you know, they could, or, or not even, not necessarily directly part of his kingdom, but they might still uh, owe a certain allegiance to that king um, or not directly a part of that king's territory. Um. You know, for example, a, a count or a duke, uh, some of these guys might be, uh, you know, could be vassals to a king, and then they might still have, um, uh, of course, counts and dukes would have vassals under them as well, and then their vassals might have vassals under them. And really, this is just kind of the machine around which uh, medieval uh, government at this time functioned. It functioned through these systems of loyalty. And they could get pretty complex at times. Uh, one thing that medieval uh, aristocrats seemed to take very seriously was the specific titles in which they held um, a certain 
land. Uh, there was very much a sense that, you know, just because you held a certain title or certain land didn't mean necessarily that you now owned it. It meant that you were the custodian of it at that time, and it still existed as a unit. It couldn't be just uh, made a part of yours. Like, let's say, you know, a good example of this might be um, Raymond IV, the Count of Toulouse. Now, Raymond IV had, he, he had a lot of territory that he held under a variety of other titles. He was Count of Toulouse, Duke of Narbonne, and Margrave of Provence, and he had some other titles as well. But it's interesting, I mean, just because he held all those titles and those territories, it wasn't like, okay, well, now all that's just a part of the County of Toulouse, you know, because that's, uh, you know, that's who rules over this stuff. Uh, the idea was he filled all of those offices, and those uh, offices could change hands or be separated later on. Now, the relationship between a lord and his vassal, or, you know, between a, a lord and his knight, um, was that a knight was, they both owed each other something. Um, a lord owed his vassal protection, support, um, owed him largesse, owed him generosity, uh, owed him his livelihood in some cases, and a vassal owed his lord service, loyalty, um, you know, rising to the call of duty when, uh, when, that, when that came, uh, if his lord was in danger or his lands were threatened, the loyalty of a vassal demanded that he aid him. And at the same time, if a, a vassal was a lord himself and his land was threatened, well, then he could rely on his overlord or the lord above him to come and help him if that lord was doing his job. So let's say you're the count of something and uh, some other count attacks your land and the king of something is your, is your lord, well, that king should come and, and help you repel that invasion. One thing that's very interesting about the medieval warrior aristocracy is this idea of largesse or the idea of the generosity of his lord upon his dependents. And this was very important. This was a symbol of the power and the greatness of a particular lord. Um, uh, oftentimes, at certain times a year, a lord would buy uh, all sorts of important things, uh, equipment, clothing, uh, for his vassals as kind of a symbol. And, you know, not just a symbol, but as an actual uh, expression of his generosity and the fact that he takes care of his men. And the thing is, medieval aristocrats they had very different ideas about wealth and how you use it than we do today. They didn't hoard wealth, or they, they didn't think that was, um, that was important, because this was an age, of course, when you know, military power and the loyalty of one's uh, men was mostly more important than you know, the power of capital. Uh, it's more of a merchant-type attitude, you know, saving, uh, hoarding away money or something like that. Um, and of course, it makes a lot more sense in today's economy, but a, a, a king or a, a great lord often was willing to kind of spend everything he had, and um, you know, it, was, it was acceptable to, say, borrow um, a lot if you, if you needed to, and to distribute largesse upon your men. And uh, this, was, this was the proper use of wealth. This was uh, you know, uh, protecting your, your interests, in fact, and ensuring the the good and survival of your domain was to, to be very um, liberal in your spending upon your vassals and upon your dependents. Now, another type of knight would have been a retainer or a household knight. And a household knight was someone who didn't have lands of his own or didn't, didn't have a, a lordship of some kind that he, that he received from, um, from his lord. But he was simply a, a fighting man in the service of his lord. Um, he might live at the castle with his lord or uh, garrison certain sites, certain fortifications for his lord. Um, he, would be, he would basically get his livelihood directly from, um, from his, his lord, not from you know, some sort of uh, land that produced an income. And uh, such a person would have been an important part of the household of a medieval lord. And this is very interesting. Uh, a, 
this was kind of very much wrapped up in the idea of family. Um, a, a man's retainers were almost like uh, his family members. They were, uh, they were his companions. They fought with him. They, uh, they uh, celebrated with him. They received. Uh, they shared in his bounty. Uh, they received largesse from him. So this was just uh, a very close and important relationship that existed among the military aristocracy of this time. This was very close to the ancient Roman idea of a household. Um, a lord's household didn't just include his wife and children and uh, blood family members. It also included um, important clients and men that, um, you know, his knights, his warriors who were around him as his advisors, as his companions in arms, that sort of thing. How was a knight educated during this period? Well, his very youngest years would have belonged to the ladies of the castle or wherever he was living. Um, when a knight was very young or a, a, the son of a nobleman was very young, probably from you know, about, uh, you know, his youngest years until he was about six or seven or something like that, he would have learned from the women uh, things like prayer, decorum, uh, poetry, um, you know, proper manners in a court, that sort of thing. Uh, and this was an important part of, of his education. Uh, some knights, as a part of their education, would have also learned from clergymen, especially, um, you know, as um, the higher ranking you were, the more important clergyman might uh, be assigned to be your tutor or that sort of thing. A good example of this would be the son of King Almoric of Jerusalem, uh, the future King Baldwin IV of Jerusalem. His personal tutor when he was young was William of Tyre, the Archbishop of Tyre, so one of the most important clergymen in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. So this would have been a place where he got um, uh, very well educated, and uh, the education, the literary education of knights, um, increased over time uh, throughout this period. In the 11th century, not a lot of uh, knights were reading men, were men of uh, literate men. And by the time we get into the late 12th and especially into the 13th century, you start to see a lot more um, literacy and uh, interest in writing and reading from uh, medieval knights. As an example of this, um, our earliest chronicles of the Crusades from the 11th century are all written by clergymen for the most part, although there's some question about the Gesta Francorum. Some have speculated whether it might not have been written by a Norman knight who happened to be literate. And that's uh, an important exception, is that during that period of time, some uh, noblemen who ended up as knights, as warriors, may have started out their life uh, being educated for the church. An example of that is Baldwin I of Jerusalem. But uh, before he finished his education and became a clergyman, he left that life and became a knight, but he still had the legacy of that education. So when he was king of Jerusalem, he um, knew very intimately the, the legal structure of the church and that sort of thing, and was a, a literate person. Uh, and so he could uh, argue um, the law and, uh, of the church with, uh, with the best of, of clergymen. So quite interesting. But again, literacy increased um, over the course of the High Middle Ages among uh, the medieval aristocracy. And uh, by the time we get to the 13th century, we have chronicles, uh, accounts of the Crusades written by knights themselves. A great example of this would be uh, the uh, uh, chronicle of Geoffrey de Villarduin, who, who participated in and helped chronicle the Fourth Crusade. So he wrote a very famous chronicle of the conquest of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade. And another individual like this would be the knight Jean of Joinville, who was um, one of St. Louis the Ninth of France's knights, and he chronicled St. Louis's crusade, the Seventh Crusade. So, another important part of a knight's education, of course, was learning from other knights, and this would have uh, been the bulk of his childhood and uh, adolescence. Um, he would have been trained in warfare by uh, men in his family, um, oftentimes, a young uh, aristocratic lad would have gone off to a, an important relative's household where he would have learned from the knights and warriors there all about fighting. And the, the training was quite rigorous. 
they had to learn to fight on horseback, to, to wield a lance and a shield, um, to engage in complicated cavalry tactics in groups. Um, the type of physical uh, rigor involved in this, and this, these guys were athletes. I mean, they, they would have been in, in very good shape and would have been very capable fighters by the time their education was complete. And there was a system that developed to some extent, and that was this idea of the page to the squire to the knight. A page was a very young boy who basically acted as kind of a, a minor assistant to, um, to the knights and uh, nobility around him, um, you know, fetching, fetching drinks, uh, uh, taking messages back and forth and that sort of thing, just minor tasks. Um, that he would have done to serve uh, the great men and women of the household. Uh, he would then graduate as a boy to a squire, and this is where the bulk of his military training would take place, uh, where he would basically be directly an assistant to a knight. He would prepare weapons, prepare armor, maintain horses, uh, really learn from the inside out the trade of the knight, and he would also often assist in battle. With, uh, with, uh, with the knight who he served. Squires uh, participated in battle at times. Um, this kind of varied depending on the time and place, uh, you know, what sort of military role a squire would acquire. Uh, their role in, in fighting seems to have increased over time. Um, in fact, uh, by the time we get into the late 12th century, a squire was not necessarily a knight in training. He might have just been a professional squire. This almost... This supportive role to a knight almost evolved into um, a professional, a professional type of class. You know, so uh, these, you know, th these guys were very valuable to knights and were a very important assistant. And so they could have, uh, you know, knights. Uh, this was a role that knights needed filled for them. A young man became a knight in the process of a ceremony in which he was knighted. Uh, this would be done by another knight. He would swear an oath to uphold uh, the vows of a knight. It was almost like a religious thing. We do not have a lot of uh, specific evidence about exactly what sort of oath was sworn or exactly what was involved in the ceremony, but we know that it was a very important thing. Um, oftentimes there would be a vigil all night long the night before in which a knight would pray, or the knight-to-be would pray before um, you know, before the Blessed Sacrament uh, in a church. And the next day, this ceremony would take place. It would be quite uh, solemn. And um, it was, it was a, a spiritual thing as well. You know, this was uh, conveying knighthood upon, upon a young man, and uh, it was a powerful thing. At this point, I would just like to take a short break to read a review written for my novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage?, a novel of the Crusades set during the reign of King Baldwin II of Jerusalem. This is from Annette Godot. She says, great read. Couldn't put it down. I love how he stays true to history. Great imagery as well. Annette, thank you so much. It really means a lot to me to get that kind of feedback from my readers. So thanks so much for reading my novel. And now let's get back to the podcast. So what about the daily life of a knight or his activities? What did a knight spend all his time doing? Well, knights were men of action, and when active warfare wasn't going on, they were often engaged in physical activity and training-type activities to keep up their skills. These were primarily tournaments and especially hunting. Um, hunting was, was a passion of medieval aristocrats. They, um, they would do it with a lot of vigor, and uh, it helped them... Uh, also, with training young knights, young knights were incorporated into, or um, you know, knights in training would be incorporated into into hunts, and this helped with uh, developing cavalry tactics, developing group cohesion. One thing about uh, the way knights fought is in cavalry formations is they very much fought in groups, and oftentimes these groups formed kind of these contingents uh, or bodies that. Uh, involved, included relatives, guys who grew up together, who grew up around each other, who came from the same region, and they would become very close and have a brotherly type bond that would serve them well in, in actual combat. And one of the places where these bonds were formed was in medieval hunts. If you've ever seen 
footage of uh, modern day British aristocrats engaged in these fox hunts. Um, that is the uh, descendant, the far more formalized and uh, far more, you know, formalized and uh, uh, smooth around the edges version of what a medieval hunt at this time was like. And I think they were, they were from the accounts we have, I think they were far rougher uh, affairs. A knight would also spend a lot of time attending his lord. Uh, he would do things like witness charters and marriages, uh, be involved in government functions. Knights were also very important as counselors to their lord. Um, when you read medieval chronicles, you'll often hear about how a, a lord uh, went to his council to, uh, to discuss an issue with them, and they came to a decision that way. Um, well, this council was usually the body of his men, uh, his, the important men in his household, who would advise him. Um, medieval life was very communal and very social. Uh, oftentimes a Lord would, would have, have his guys around him all the time. Uh, this was, uh, they, they shared his life with him and, uh, because, you know, the, the lifestyle of a medieval Lord was so rigorous and often involved a lot of travel. They would travel together and, uh, he would, uh, a knight could, would also act as a bodyguard to his Lord or could act as a bodyguard to him. Um, a lord would have his guys around him to pre prevent him from being assassinated by, uh, you know, somebody who might want to kill him. Or uh, when, when traveling, of course, uh, medieval uh, travel in the Middle Ages was dangerous because of robbers and uh, even attacks from, you know, uh, enemy, nearby enemies. This was especially true in the Crusader states where attacks from neighboring Muslim uh, powers uh, were, was always a danger. So, Travel was kind of a military affair in itself. Um, a, a lord traveled with a large entourage of his fighting men around him, and they, uh, they traveled prepared to fight if need be. It wasn't all work, of course. Uh, knights spent times at banquets and feasts, um, special holy days and occasions of, uh, of feasting in the, in the church's calendar. It would be a time when knights would share in the joy and the celebrations of, a, of their lord. Of course, the marriage of a... Uh, of a young nobleman or noblewoman, a king's or a lord's daughter or sons getting married would be an occasion of joy and celebration. Another thing that's interesting is the idea of, uh, as especially as we get into the 13th century and we get into this uh, troubadour culture and the culture of uh, sort of um, a knight uh, paying court to a lady or uh, singing or... Uh, in, you know, and doing poetry or something like that, um, reciting these kind of things. Um, there's a phrase from Jean of Joinville's uh, Chronicle of the Seventh Crusade where he, he's talking uh, with a knight, and um, one of them says, uh, Someday we shall recall this day as we sit in the chambers of ladies. And what he's talking about is kind of this social activity of, of you know, in the among the medieval aristocracy, um, the aristocrats, uh, men and women, they socialized with each other. Of course, it was important that this always be in large groups uh, because for unmarried uh, men and women to be alone together would have been a scandal. But uh, there was, it wasn't like, you know, women were uh, confined off to, to a w women's wing or something like that. Um, so what happened in these, these social settings, you know, the, the, uh, as, as we sit about talking in, in ladies' chambers, well, you recount great events, of course. You recount um, uh, great battles, like I believe this was the Battle of Mansoura that, uh, that Jean of Joinville uh, was referencing at that part of his chronicle. But, you know, these would be uh, things that ladies would want to hear about. They would want to hear about uh, your, your great works of uh, bravery and your, your courage in battle. Um, poetry was uh, recited back and forth. Um, this would be an occasion to read out loud. Uh, reading was very much an out loud activity in the Middle Ages. You didn't kind of sit by yourself and read a book. No, you had a group of people um, hanging out, and uh, somebody would read from one of the great works, uh, you know, something from um, a classical author, perhaps, or um, something, you know, from a, a great tale of uh, uh, perhaps even the ancestors of that particular uh, household recounting their great deeds. Uh, Chronicles of the Crusades were a popular thing to be read at this time. So, a knight would also concern himself with religious activity. 
Um, a lot of knights during this period of time were very devout. Uh, some of them attended Mass daily. There were kings who attended Mass daily. Of course, crusading became a very important activity in this period of time and a way for medieval aristocrats to express their piety. Now, what about during wartime? Uh, what sort of things did a knight do during wartime? Well, raiding would be one thing, and this was uh, the practice of uh, inflicting damage on your enemy's lands, so his livelihood. So if two uh, lords were at war with one another, then one thing they would do is attack each other's territory, basically just by ravaging it, burning villages and fields and farmland. Now, of course, when this was done, this was absolutely devastating for the peasant population that, uh, that ended up getting the brunt of this uh, it was meant to damage uh, the livelihood of the Lord, but of course the livelihood of the Lord was the livelihood of the peasants, and it was so it was a devastating, horrible thing for them when they would be uh, victimized by these raids. And this is the sort of activity that the church tried to stamp out with concepts like the truce of God and indeed the crusading movement itself. Um, the church was always pushing to end any kind of warfare among Christian nobility and get them to unite behind the idea of crusading and simply turn their military power against uh, you know, the non-Christian powers like the Muslims. And of course, this was never fully realized, but this was the ideal of the crusade that the church pushed, and indeed some, uh, some aristocrats pushed as well. Another activity in wartime was sieges, and of course, this was the long, drawn-out um, investment of a city or a fortified position in an attempt to uh, take over that position, to get past the defenses or starve out the defenders and take control of, of that site. And of course, controlling fortified positions was the, a key strategic thing in, uh, in medieval politics. And in the last but and probably least frequent sort of activity that happened in war was actual pitched battles. Now, bat full, full on battles between two uh, fully uh, engaged medieval armies, uh, these were rare events. There were some kings who, who never fought any in their entire career. But this would have been a time when uh, the cavalry tactics and the uh, rigorous military tr training of knights would have come into, um, into play when it really mattered. Now, what about marriage? This is an interesting question because it brings up a lot of issues surrounding knighthood. Could, um, what sort of knight could be married? Well, the earliest idea seems to have been that for once a knight was married, he needed to have his own um, grant of lands. And this was, this was the earlier period. And in this time, like a household knight was another term for them uh, could be bachelor knight. So the idea is that this was a knight who was not yet married. So he was simply in the entourage of, of a lord. Um, he did not need to have his own bedchamber. Uh, one interesting thing about medieval life is they had a very different concept of privacy than we have today. Uh, today in our world, it's, it's very important for each person to have their own bedroom where they can go and get some privacy and you know, get away from the world. Medieval people didn't really have this concept. Uh, the great hall of a lord... Uh, doubled as a, a sleeping quarter at night. Uh, there would have been uh, pallets and cots and that sort of thing all throughout uh, that could have been spread out in a great hall with maybe you know some curtain partitions here and there. And um, in, in people in the, uh, the Lord's entourage would have slept there, including some of, his, uh, some of his knights. And the idea was, okay, well, to, once, once it's time for you to be married, you need to have your own grant of land so that you can have a castle that has a bedchamber where the lord and lady sleep. Um, the earliest castles had one actual bedchamber in them, which usually was situated above the, um, the great hall, and this would have been where um, sort of the core of the lordship existed, and that is the bed of the, of the lord and his lady. Now, this seems to have changed over time. Um, as we get uh, into the later High Middle Ages and into the Late Middle Ages, um, and things like money fiefs became more common, so that is like a grant that is a, an income of money rather than uh, necessarily a, a grant of land. Um, knights who didn't necessarily have their own uh, lordships or domains of land um, uh, may have been marrying 
But uh, and this this wasn't necessarily a hard and fast r- rule in the earlier period as well. Uh, um, but that does seem to be the trend and how it developed. And also keep in mind that just because a uh, a bachelor knight wasn't married, that didn't mean he didn't have a woman or women. He may have had a mistress of some sort, or he may have just been a ladies' man. It it happened. So um, you know we have to take that into account as well. He may have even had uh, some bastard children. So anyway, there you go. That's uh, a little overview of the life of a medieval knight. I appreciate you guys uh, listening and uh, being a supporter here of Real Crusades History. If you like what I do, uh, please click on the link below to my Patreon where you can become a Patreon supporter. I offer quite a few cool rewards there for my Patreon supporters, so there's some good stuff you can get involved in. And also, if you want to just make a PayPal donation to support my work, you can do that. There's a PayPal link below. Uh, Also, check out my novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage, and my CD of music, Scatheless. I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks so much. (music) 